Welcome to the second video in our skeletal system series. Today we'll finish up the axial skeleton by looking at the bones of the spinal column or the vertebrae as well as the bones of the thoracic cage which surrounds our thoracic cavity or chest cavity. We'll start by looking at all of the vertebrae in the spinal column. When we look at the vertebrae, we see that we have multiple different types of vertebrae that all come together to form the column as a whole. At the very top, we have our cervical vertebrae, seven cervical vertebrae. Then we have 12 thoracic vertebrae that we see articulate with the ribs that surround the thoracic cavity. Below the 12 thoracic vertebrae, we have five lumbar vertebrae in the lower back. Finally, at the base of the spine, we have this triangular shaped bone called the sacrum. And at the very base, we have the coccyx or tailbone, which is actually the fusion of several bones left over evolutionary wise from the tail. When we look at the spine as a whole, we see that it's a curved structure. It has four different curves, two that are concave curves that cave inward. We call those lordosis. And we have two curves that are convex curves that flex outward. We call those kyphosis. So up top here, we have a cervical lordosis where the spine curves inwards. Next, we have a thoracic kyphosis Okay, where the thoracic vertebrae curve outwards, then the lumbar lordosis, and finally the sacral kyphosis. Okay, these two curves, these two convex curves that flex outward at the back of the thoracic cavity and then down here at the back of the pelvic cavity are there to accommodate the major organs that we have in those two cavities. Okay, the reason that we have these lordosis curves are to balance the kyphosis, okay? Because these are curving outward, these have to flex inward a little bit to maintain balance of the body. So now we'll take a second and look at each of the individual vertebrae in the spine so that we can see the different processes and foramen that each vertebrae has in common, and also so that we can distinguish the difference between the different types of vertebrae. We'll start by looking at the cervical vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae are the smallest of all of the vertebrae. Okay, so we see that this portion here called the body is very small. The vertebral body is very small in the cervical vertebrae. Also, we can tell that this is a cervical vertebrae because it has these little holes on the side. These are the transverse foramen. The cervical vertebrae are the only vertebrae that have these transverse foramen. So looking at this right off the bat, you can tell me that this is a cervical vertebrae. When we look at the cervical vertebrae, I want you to be able to name the different processes that the vertebrae has. Okay? Towards the back of each of our vertebrae, posterior, we have this process that sticks out and downward called the spinous process. This spinous process is what you actually see sticking out of your back when you bend over and you feel those ridges of your spine. Those are all of your spinous processes, okay? Also, on the sides of each vertebrae, we have transverse processes, okay? So this is a transverse foramen. This is a transverse process sticking right out from the edge of it. This is also a transverse process. Finally, we have two pairs of processes, top and on the bottom, that are called articular processes because these are how the vertebrae articulate with each other. Okay, it's how they, they articulate, they link together and move at their articular processes. So these articular processes are named either superior articular processes for the ones on top and inferior articular processes for the ones that are on the bottom. You can figure out top versus bottom by looking at this spinous process. Okay, the spinous process, remember, is going to angle downward. So if we look at it this way, we can see that it's angled downward. So that means these must be the top, the superior articular processes. 
and down here must be the inferior articular processes. Okay. We said that this was the vertebral body, and the body is where the vertebrae stack on top of each other, okay, one after the next. That supports most of the weight that goes onto the spinal column. And in between each of these bodies, we'll have a disc, okay, a cartilaginous disc that helps to absorb some of the shock. Finally, this major hole in the center of the vertebrae is the vertebral foramen. Okay? When we look at the vertebrae all lined up on top of each other, we'll see that these foramen, these vertebral foramen, align with each other. And they create the vertebral canal or the spinal canal where your spinal cord will go down from the brain down to the very bottom of the spinal column. So when we look at the cervical vertebrae, we see that the top two cervical vertebrae are actually special vertebrae. And I want you to be able to know them by name. The top two cervical vertebrae are called the axis and the atlas. Okay, so C1, the very first vertebrae that we have, is the atlas. Just like in Greek mythology, Atlas held the world up on his shoulders. Okay, so this holds your head. C2, the second cervical vertebrae, is the axis. And we see that they sit together just like this. When we look at C1, the atlas, we see that it's the only vertebrae that does not have a body. There's no vertebral body here. And that's because where the body would be, we have a projection sticking up okay, from the axis. When we see C1, we still have our transverse processes. Okay, we have an itty bitty little, which would be spinous process. Okay, we have our transverse foramen. We have our vertebral foramen. But you see these really large superior articular processes. Okay, these large, flat, superior articular processes. These are important because they articulate, they articulate right here with the base of the occipital bone. Okay? We have our occipital condyles that sit right into those superior articular processes, and they allow you to shake your head yes. So when we look at C2, the second cervical vertebrae, which we also call the axis, okay, again, we still have our vertebral foramen, the large hole. If we look at either side, we still have our transverse foramen. We have a spinous process sticking out towards the back, angle downward. Okay. Outside of these transverse foramen, we have our transverse processes. And then we have here these large flat processes are our superior articular processes. And then coming downward here, we have the inferior articular processes. When we look at the bottom of it, this big rounded portion is the vertebral body. But we also have this specialized structure sticking up right here. It looks kind of like the horn on a saddle. And we call this the dens. The dens is important because it comes right up here okay, into C1, our atlas, and it allows us to pivot, it allows us to pivot to shake our head no, we okay, or to turn our head from side to side. Okay, so again, that's the dens. And that's it for the cervical vertebrae. Remember that we have seven cervical vertebrae, and after the cervical vertebrae, we get to the thoracic vertebrae. We have 12 thoracic vertebrae. Looking at the thoracic vertebrae, we see that they're a little bit bigger than the cervical vertebrae. They have a bigger body. Also, when we look at the spinous process sticking out of the back, we see that it's very long and pointy. It's long and pointy. That tells us we're looking at a, a thoracic vertebrae. Also, we don't have any transverse foramen. Okay, there's no holes on the side like we had here. So that's how you can tell me that we're looking at thoracic. Okay? As far as the individual structures on a thoracic vertebrae, 
Again, the vertebral body, the vertebral foramen, the spinous process. Okay. Then again, we have two transverse processes that stick out to the sides. Okay. And then we have two superior articular processes and two inferior articular processes. These inferior articular processes are pretty hard to see, but you can see a little swelling here, okay, on either side. And again, the point of these articular processes is that it links the vertebrae together and allows for a slight movement or slight articulation. Okay. When we're looking at the vertebrae, we're trying to distinguish which type of vertebrae this is. The thoracic vertebrae looks like a giraffe, okay, when you're looking at it from the back. It looks just like a giraffe. Going down further, we get to the lumbar vertebrae. Again, we have five lumbar vertebrae. Looking at the lumbar vertebrae, we see that these are the largest of our vertebrae, a very big vertebral body. Also, when we look at the spinous process, we see that it's shorter and wider. Okay, this looks more like a moose than a giraffe. Okay. Again, the vertebral body, the vertebral foramen, the spinous process out towards the back. Okay. On the sides here, we have our transverse processes. And then we have our articular processes, our superior articular processes, and our inferior articular processes. Again, to try and tell the difference, to figure out which is the top and which is the bottom, you can simply look at the spinous process. It always angles downward. So turning it to the side, we see that this is angled downward. So we know that this is the top and this is the bottom. So superior and inferior articular processes. Okay. Remember that at the base of the spine, we have this triangular shaped bone called the sacrum. Okay, so this whole thing here is the sacrum. This base portion here is the coccyx or tailbone. When you're trying to orient yourself to see which is the front and which is the back of the sacrum, okay, you know that it curves okay, to allow for space for our reproductive organs. Okay, so this is the front that kind of cradles our reproductive organs, and this is the back. The back is also more bumpy with ridges, and these articular processes on the top. Okay, so looking at the sacrum, this rounded portion here is the base. Okay, this is the base, and that is where the vertebral body of the lumbar vertebrae sits. Okay, just like this on the base. Sticking up on the back of the sacrum, we have these articular processes. The articular processes articulate with the inferior articular processes of the bottom vertebrae, L5. Okay. Looking at the sacrum, we have all of these little holes present. Those are the sacral foramina. Okay, those holes are there so that nerves can fray off of the spinal cord and go through the sacrum down into the lower legs. When we look at this, the base or the top portion of the sacrum, we have this ridge that sticks out here. This is called the premontory. Okay, the premontory. And that's an important landmark for obstetricians during a female's pregnancy. Finally, when we look at the back of the sacrum, we have these ridges that stick up. Okay, these are, this is called the median sacral crest. Okay, median because it's in the middle. Okay, sacral because it's on the sacrum. And it's a crest, okay, a swelling that's pointing out. Okay, so the median sacral crest, the articular processes, the base, the premontory, the sacral foramina, the sacrum as a whole, and the coccyx. So that's it for the spinal cord. The other part 
The other part of the axial skeleton is the thoracic cage or the rib cage. Again, the thoracic cage forms a protective barrier around the lungs and the heart. When we look at the very front of the thoracic cage, we have the sternum, okay, the sternum or your breastbone. Okay? The sternum has a main center portion called the body, okay, the body of the sternum. It has this little pointy portion at the very bottom called the xiphoid process. And then it has this large portion at the top called the manubrium. So the manubrium, the body of the sternum, and the xiphoid process. When we look at the manubrium, we see this little indentation or divot at the top. That's the jugular notch. Okay, and we utilize that jugular notch as a um, as kind of a starting point when we're trying to count the ribs to find the location of the heart. So coming off of the sternum, we see our ribs. Okay? So each of these is showing us one of the ribs. And we have 12 pairs of ribs in both males and females. You'll notice, however, that the ribs don't connect directly to the sternum. We have this area here of cartilage. These cartilages are called the costal cartilages. Those cartilages are important because they allow for expansion of the rib cage, and we do that every time we breathe. Okay, so these are the ribs. We have 12 pairs. These are the costal cartilages. The ribs themselves can be split up into true ribs and false ribs. The first seven pairs of ribs are true ribs because their, co their costal cartilages attach directly to the sternum. The bottom pairs of ribs are called false ribs because their cartilages piggyback onto the cartilage from the rib before. Okay, so these are our false ribs down here. Finally, the bottom two pairs of ribs are called floating ribs. Okay, and you'll see that they don't have a costal cartilage at all. They're simply free floating on the distal end. Okay? So if we look at just the rib itself, okay, this is the rib. Okay, we see that it's a flat bone with a curved structure, and then one side of it is more curved than the other side. This part that's got a sharper curve is the part that goes in the back. Okay, that's in the back of the body, and it articulates with the vertebrae. Okay, so looking at the rib itself, we call this end here, that's by the curved side, the head of the rib. Okay, the head. That's the portion that's actually going to butt up against one of the thoracic vertebrae. Okay, it's going to sit just like this, okay, in the thoracic vertebrae. Okay. Then this swollen part right here is the tubercle, the tubercle of the rib. Okay, so when we put the rib in up against the thoracic vertebrae, the head sits right in that divot, and the tubercle articulates with the transverse process. Okay? So that sums up our lecture on the axial skeleton. Next, we'll go to the appendicular skeleton, where we look at the bones of the arms and the legs, as well as the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle.